Chapter Four, Part One of A Chronicle of Eighteen Twelve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Chronicle of Eighteen Twelve by William Wood. Chapter Four, Part One. Eighteen Twelve, Brock at Detroit and Queenston Heights. The prorogation which released Brock from his parliamentary duties on August 5th had been followed by eight days of the most strenuous military work, especially on the part of the little reinforcement which he was taking west to Amherstburg. The Upper Canada militiamen, drawn from the United Empire Loyalists and from the British-born, had responded with hearty good will, all the way from Glengarry to Niagara but the population was so scattered and equipment so scarce that no attempt had been made to have whole battalions of select embodied militia ready for the beginning of the war as in the more thickly peopled province of lower canada the best that could be done was to embody the two flank companies the light and grenadier companies of the most urgently needed battalions but as these companies contained all the picked men who were readiest for immediate service and as the Americans were very slow in mobilizing their own still more unready army, Brock found that, for the time being, York could be left and Detroit attacked with nothing more than his handful of regulars, backed by the flank company militiamen and the provincial marine. Leaving York the very day he closed the house there, Brock sailed over to Burlington Bay, marched across the neck of the Niagara Peninsula, and embarked at Long Point with every man the boats could carry, three hundred, all told, forty regulars of the forty-first and two hundred and sixty flank company militiamen. Then, for the next five days, he fought his way, inch by inch, along the north shore of Lake Erie against a persistent westerly storm. The news, by the way, was discouraging. Hull's invasion had unsettled the Indians as far east as the Niagara Peninsula, which the local militia were consequently afraid to leave defenseless. But once Brock had reached the scene of action, his insight showed him what bold skill could do to turn the tide of feeling all along the western frontier. It was getting on for one o'clock in the morning of August 14th, when Lieutenant Rollitt challenged Brock's leading boat from aboard the provincial marine schooner General Hunter. As Brock stepped ashore, he ordered all commanding officers to meet him within an hour. He then read Hull's dispatches, which had been taken by Rollett with the captured schooner, and by Tecumseh at Brownstone. By two o'clock all the principal officers and Indian chiefs had assembled, not as a council of war, but simply to tell Brock everything they knew. Only Tecumseh and Colonel Nicoll, the quartermaster of the little army, thought that Detroit itself could be attacked with any prospect of success. Brock listened attentively, made up his mind, told his officers to get ready for immediate attack, asked Tecumseh to assemble all the Indians at noon, and dismissed the meeting at four. Brock and Tecumseh read each other at a glance, and Tecumseh, turning to the tribal chiefs, said simply, This is a man, a commendation approved by them all with laconic, deep ho-hos. Tecumseh was the last great leader of the Indian race, and perhaps the finest embodiment of all its better qualities. Like Pontiac, fifty years before, but in a nobler way, he tried to unite the Indians against the exterminating American advance. He was apparently on the eve of forming his Indian alliance when he returned home to find that his brother, the Prophet, had just been defeated at Tippecanoe. The defeat itself was no great thing, but it came precisely at a time when it could exert most influence on the unstable Indian character, and be most effective in breaking up the alliance of the tribes. Tecumseh, divining this at once, lost no time in vain regrets, but joined the British next year at Amherstburg. He came with only thirty followers. But stray warriors kept on arriving, and many of the bolder spirits joined him when war became imminent. At the time of Brock's arrival there were a thousand effective Indians under arms. Their arming was only authorized at the last minute for Brock's dispatch to Prevost shows how strictly neutral the Canadian government had been throughout the recent troubles between the Indians and the Americans. He mentions that the chiefs at Amherstburg had long been trying to obtain the muskets and ammunition which for years had been withheld, agreeably to the instructions received from Sir James Craig, and since repeated by Your Excellency. Precisely at noon Brock took his stand beneath a giant oak at Amherstburg surrounded by his officers. 
Before him sat Tecumseh. Behind Tecumseh sat the chiefs, and behind the chiefs a thousand Indians in their war-paint. Brock then stepped forward to address them. Erect, alert, broad-shouldered, and magnificently tall, blue-eyed, fair-haired, with frank and handsome countenance, he looked every inch the champion of a great and righteous cause. He said the long knives had come to take away the land from both the Indians and the British whites, and that now he would not be content merely to repulse them, but would follow and beat them on their own side of Detroit. After the pause that was usual on grave occasions, Tecumseh rose and answered for all his followers. He stood there, the ideal of an Indian chief, tall, stately, and commanding, yet tense, lithe, observant, and always ready for his spring. He the tiger, Brock the lion, and both unflinchingly at bay. Next morning, August 15th, an early start was made for Sandwich, some twelve miles north, where a five-gun battery was waiting to be unmasked against Detroit across the river. Arrived at Sandwich, Brock immediately sent across his aide-de-camp, Colonel MacDonnell, with a letter summoning Hull to surrender. Hull wrote back to say he was prepared to stand his ground. Brock at once unmasked his battery and made ready to attack next day. With the men on detachment, Hull still had a total of twenty-five hundred. Brock had only fifteen hundred, including the provincial marine. But Hull's men were losing what discipline they had, and were becoming distrustful, both of their leaders and of themselves, while Brock's men were gaining discipline, zeal, and inspiring confidence with every hour. Besides, the British were all effectives, while Hull had over five hundred absent from Detroit, and as many more ineffective on the spot, which left him only fifteen hundred actual combatants. He also had a thousand non-combatants, men, women, and children, all cowering for shelter from the dangers of battle, and half dead with the far more terrifying apprehension of an Indian massacre. Brock's five-gun battery made excellent practice during the afternoon, without suffering any material damage in return. One chance shell produced a most dismaying effect in Detroit by killing Hanks, the late commandant of Mackinaw, and three other officers with him. At twilight, the firing ceased on both sides. Immediately after dark, Tecumseh led six hundred eager followers down to their canoes, a little way below Sandwich. These Indians were told off by tribes, as battalions are by companies. There, in silent, dusky groups, moving soft-footed on their moccasins through the gloom, were Shawnees and Miamis from Tecumseh's own lost home, beside the Wabash, Foxes and Sacks from the Iowan Valley, Ottawas and Wyandots, Chippewas and Potawatomis, some braves from the middle prairies between the Illinois and the Mississippi, and even Winnebagoes and Dakotas from the far northwest. The flotilla of crowded canoes moved stealthily across the river, with no louder noise than the rippling current made. As secretly, the Indians crept ashore, stole inland through the quiet night, and circling north cut off Hull's army from the woods. Little did Hull's anxious sentries think that some of the familiar cries of night-birds round the fort were signals being passed along from scout to scout. As the beautiful summer dawn began to break at four o'clock that fateful Sunday morning, the British force fell in, only seven hundred strong, and more than half militia. The thirty gunners who had served in the sandwich battery so well the day before also fell in, with five little field-pieces, in case Brock could force a battle in the open. Their places in the battery were ably filled by every man of the provincial marine whom Captain Hall could spare from the Queen Charlotte, the flagship of the tiny Canadian flotilla. Brock's men and his light artillery were soon afloat and making for Spring Wells, more than three miles below Detroit. Then, as the Queen Charlotte ran up her sunrise flag, she and the Sandwich Battery roared out a challenge, to which the Americans replied with random aim. Brock leaped ashore formed front towards Hull, got into touch with Tecumseh's Indians on his left, and saw that the British land and water batteries were protecting his right, as prearranged with Captain Hall. He had intended to wait in this position, hoping that Hull would march out to the attack. But even before his men had finished taking post, the whole problem was suddenly changed by the arrival of an Indian to say that MacArthur's four hundred picked men, whom Hull had sent south to bring in the convoy, were returning to Detroit at once. There was now only a moment to decide whether to retreat across the river, 
form front against MacArthur, or rush Detroit immediately. But within that fleeting moment Brock divined the true solution, and decided to march straight on. With Tecumseh riding a grey mustang by his side, he led the way in person. He wore his full-dress gold and scarlet uniform, and rode his charger Alfred, the splendid grey which Governor Craig had given him the year before, with the recommendation that the whole continent of America could not furnish you with so safe and excellent a horse, and for the good reason that I wished to secure from my old favourite a kind and careful master. The seven hundred redcoats made a gallant show, all the more imposing because the militia were wearing some spare uniforms, borrowed from the regulars, and because the confident appearance of the whole body led the discouraged Americans to think that these few could only be the vanguard of much greater numbers. So strong was this belief that Hull, in sudden panic, sent over to Sandwich to treat for terms, and was astounded to learn that Brock and Tecumseh were the two men on the big grey horses straight in front of him. While Hull's envoys were crossing the river and returning, the Indians were beginning to raise their war-whoops in the woods, and Brock was reconnoitring within a mile of the fort. This looked formidable enough, if properly defended, as the ditch was six feet deep and twelve feet wide. The parapet rose twenty feet, the palisades were of twenty-inch cedar, and thirty-three guns were pointed through the embrasures. But Brock correctly estimated the human element inside, and was just on the point of advancing to the assault when Hull's white flag went up. The terms were soon agreed upon. Hull's whole army, including all detachments, surrendered as prisoners of war, while the territory of Michigan passed into the military possession of King George. Abundance of food and military stores fell into British hands, together with the Adams, a fine new brig that had just been completed. She was soon rechristened the Detroit. The Americans sullenly trooped out. The British elatedly marched in. The Stars and Stripes came down defeated. The Union Jack went up victorious and was received with a royal salute from all the British ordnance, afloat and ashore. The Indians came out of the woods, yelling with delight and firing their muskets in the air. But grouped by tribes, they remained outside the fort and settlement, and not a single outrage was committed. Tecumseh himself rode in with Brock, and the two great leaders stood out in front of the British line while the colours were being changed. Then Brock, in view of all his soldiers, presented his sash and pistols to Tecumseh. Tecumseh, in turn, gave his many-coloured Indian sash to Brock, who wore it till the day he died. The effect of the British success at Detroit far exceeded that which had followed the capture of Mackinaw and the evacuation of Fort Dearborn. Those, however important to the West, were regarded as mainly Indian affairs. This was a white man's victory and a white man's defeat. Hull's proclamation thenceforth became a laughing-stock. The American invasion had proved a fiasco. The first American army to take the field had failed at every point. More significant still, the Americans were shown to be feeble in organization and egregiously mistaken in their expectations. Canada, on the other hand, had already found her champion, and men quite fit to follow him. Brock left Proctor in charge of the West and hurried back to the Niagara frontier. Arrived at Fort Erie on August 23rd, he was dismayed to hear of a dangerously one-sided armistice that had been arranged with the enemy. This had been first proposed on even terms by Prevost, and then eagerly accepted by Dearborn, after being modified in favour of the Americans. In proposing an armistice, Prevost had rightly interpreted the wishes of the imperial government. It was wise to see whether further hostilities could not be averted altogether, for the obnoxious orders in council had been repealed. But Prevost was criminally weak in assenting to the condition that all movements of men and materiel should continue on the American side, when he knew that corresponding movements were impossible on the British side for lack of transport. Dearborn, the American commander-in-chief, was only a second-rate general, but he was more than a match for Prevost at making bargains. Prevost was one of those men who succeed halfway up and fail at the top. Pure Swiss by blood, he had, like his father, spent his life in the British Army, and had risen to the rank of lieutenant-general. He had served with some distinction in the West Indies, and had been made a baronet for defending Dominica in 1805. In 1808 he became governor of Nova Scotia, and in 1811, at the age of forty-four, governor-general and commander-in-chief of Canada. He and his wife were popular both in the West Indies and in Canada, and, 
and he undoubtedly deserved well of the empire for having conciliated the French Canadians, who had been irritated by his predecessor, the abrupt and masterful Craig. The very important Army Bill Act was greatly due to his diplomatic handling of the French Canadians, who found him so congenial that they stood by him to the end. His native tongue was French. He understood French ways and manners to perfection, and he consequently had far more than the usual sympathy with a people whose nature and circumstances made them particularly sensitive to real or fancied slights. All this is more to his credit than his enemies were willing to admit, either then or afterwards. But in spite of all these good qualities, Prevost was not the man to safeguard British honour during the supreme ordeal of a war, and if he had lived in earlier times, when nicknames were more apt to become historic, he might well have gone down to posterity as Prevost the pusillanimous. Day after day Prevost's armistice kept the British helpless, while supplies and reinforcements for the Americans poured in at every advantageous point. Brock was held back from taking either Sackett's Harbour, which was, meanwhile, being strongly reinforced from Ogdensburg, or Fort Niagara, which was being reinforced from Oswego. Proctor was held back from taking Fort Wayne, at the point of the salient angle south of Lake Michigan and the west of Lake Erie, a quite irretrievable loss. For the moment the British had the command of all the lakes. But their golden opportunity passed, never to return. By land their chances were also quickly disappearing. On September 1st, a week before the armistice ended, there were less than seven hundred Americans directly opposed to Brock, who commanded in person at Queenston and Fort George. On the day of the battle in October there were nearly ten times as many along the Niagara frontier. The very day Brock heard that the disastrous armistice was over, he proposed an immediate attack on Sackett's harbour, but Prevost refused to sanction it. Brock then turned his whole attention to the Niagara frontier, where the Americans were assembling in such numbers that to attack them was out of the question. The British began to receive a few supplies and reinforcements. But the Americans now had got such a long start, that on the fateful 13th of October they outnumbered Brock's men four to one, four thousand to one thousand along the critical fifteen miles between the Falls and Lake Ontario, and sixty-eight hundred to seventeen hundred along the whole Niagara River, from lake to lake, a distance of thirty-three miles. The factors which helped to redress the adverse balance of these odds were Brock himself, his disciplined regulars, the intense loyalty of the militia, and the telegraph. This telegraph was a system of visually signalling by semaphore, much the same as that which Wellington had used along the lines of Torres Vedras. The immediate moral effect, however, were even more favourable to the Americans than the mere physical odds, for Prevost's armistice both galled and chilled the British, who were eager to strike a blow. American confidence had been much shaken in September by the sight of the prisoners from Detroit, who had been marched along the river road in full view of the other side. But it increased rapidly in October as reinforcements poured in. On the 8th the Council of War decided to attack Fort George and Queenston Heights, simultaneously with every available man. But Smith, the American general commanding above the falls, refused to cooperate. This compelled the adoption of a new plan, in which only a feint was to be made against Fort George, while Queenston Heights were to be carried by storm. The change entailed a good deal of extra preparation. But when Lieutenant Elliot of the American Navy cut out two British vessels at Fort Erie on the ninth, the news made the American troops so clamorous for an immediate invasion that their general, Van Rensselaer, was afraid either to resist them or to let their ardor cool. In the American camp opposite Queenston all was bustle on the 10th of October, and at three the next morning the whole army was again astir waiting till the vanguard had seized the landing on the British side. But a wrong leader had been chosen, mistakes were plentiful, and confusion followed. Nearly all the oars had been put into the first boat, which, having overshot the mark, was made fast on the British side, whereupon its commander disappeared. The troops on the American shore shivered in the drenching autumn rain till after daylight. Then they went back to their sodden camp, wet, angry, and disgusted. While the rain came down in torrents, the principal officers were busy revising their plans. Smith was evidently not to be depended upon, but it was thought that, with all the other advantages of the initiative, the four thousand other Americans could overpower the one thousand British, and secure a permanent hold on the Queenston Heights just above the village. 
These heights ran back from the Niagara River along Lake Ontario for sixty miles west, curving northeastwards round Burlington Bay to Dundas Street, which was the one regular land line of communication running west from York. Therefore, if the Americans could hold both the Niagara and the Heights, they would cut Upper Canada in two. This was, of course, quite evident to both sides. The only doubtful questions were, how should the first American attack be made, and how should it be met? The American general, Stephen Van Rensselaer, was a civilian who had been placed at the head of the New York State Militia by Governor Tompkins, both to emphasize the fact that expert regulars were only wanted as subordinates, and to win a cunning move in the game of party politics. Van Rensselaer was not only one of the greatest of the old patroons who formed the landed aristocracy of Dutch New York, but he was also a Federalist. Tompkins, who was a Democrat, therefore hoped to gain his party ends, whatever the result might be. Victory would mean that Van Rensselaer had been compelled to advance the cause of a war to which he objected, while defeat would discredit both him and his party, besides providing Tompkins with the excuse that it would have all happened very differently if a Democrat had been in charge. End of chapter 4, part 1